While we could have discussed them in any order thanks to the polytomy, I've saved these last two clades for last because of a shared and annoying characteristic, being paraphyletic. That is, paraphyletic with respect to protists. Here are the learning objectives for this whole intra-eukaryotes lecture, but we will focus on these specific learning objectives. To begin, I'll delve into the Archaeplastida. The name means ancient plastid, suggesting that these were the first photosynthetic eukaryotes, and this is a pretty good name as we understand it. Members of the Archaeplastida are photosynthetic. There are the small handful of members that have lost the ability, but even those that do not photosynthesize, there is evidence that they have lost this ability. There are two phyla of protists, though one of them is paraphyletic. These are the green algae. Some authors have suggested including all photosynthesizers that are green, the algae and the land plants, into an enlarged kingdom or a super kingdom called viridiplanti, which means green plants. The Archaeplastida diverged from the other lineages of eukaryotes sometime early in evolutionary history, but after the first endosymbiosis with the alpha proteobacterium that would become a mitochondrion. After all, all lineages of eukaryotes have mitochondria or had mitochondria and lost them. Only one lineage has chloroplast in all members, and that is this one, Archaeplastida. And the Archaeplastida seem to be the source of chloroplast for all the other photosynthetic eukaryotes we've discussed, from a process known as secondary endosymbiosis. We have seen in Excavata and SAR, algae. What are algae? Photosynthetic eukaryotes that aren't plants, essentially. We know that photosynthesis is a very complex process requiring all the workings of the chloroplast to achieve both the light reactions and the Calvin cycle. So how can such a complex process evolve multiple times independently? If we look at the phylogeny of eukaryotes once again, let's look at all phyla that have photosynthetic members. Whoa, that's a lot. As you can see, photosynthesis occurs in three of the four major clades of eukaryotes. All three clades of SAR have photosynthetic members and some euglenozoans, but most of excavata do not photosynthesize. And not all members of SAR photosynthesize either. For a while, before we had the benefit of molecular tools to test phylogenetic hypotheses, the question of how the photosynthetic lineages are related to each other was hotly contested. It was very tempting to say that since photosynthesis is such a complicated process, that it is unlikely to have evolved independently multiple times, and therefore all the algae were hypothesized to be monophyletic. Looking at this tree, it is clearly not monophyletic. It's not even paraphyletic. It's polyphyletic. How do we reconcile this information? Complexity evolving multiple times independently? Once again, we look to endosymbiosis, a secondary endosymbiosis. Primary endosymbiosis is what we see in the oldest photosynthetic lineage, Archaeplastida. Secondary endosymbiosis is when eukaryotic lineages gain photosynthesis not by engulfing a cyanobacterium, rather they engulf a red or green alga. This flowchart from a review article by Patrick J. Keeling shows how the process may have unfolded through evolutionary time, with the original cyanobacterium diverging in red and green algae. This is perhaps a bit complicated, but pause and examine if you feel the inspiration. For the rest of us, again, it's a bit like the Russian nesting dolls where the tiniest doll fits inside a larger doll and that fits inside a larger doll still. In this case, the smallest doll represents the cyanobacterium engulfed by an early archaeplastid, an event that all evidence suggests happened only one time the resulting alga, in this case a red alga. 
Then later on, another eukaryote, in this case a diatom, engulfed the photosynthetic red alga, which led to photosynthetic bacillariophyta. This secondary endosymbiosis happened multiple times, which is how we see multiple polyphyletic lineages of algae. Which brings us back to Archaeplastida and Rhodophyta. These are typically marine macroalgae, and they are often found in deeper water, though not always. Why deeper water? Well, water is not a great medium for transmitting light, like air is. Photons with less energy, towards the red end of the visible spectrum, can't penetrate as deeply. Thus, the red photons aren't absorbed. They're reflected and transmitted, and the red algae appear red, just as green plants and algae reflect and transmit green photons. Rhodophyta provides us with important products that you may not have known about. Nori is the seaweed used in sushi and other East Asian dishes. Carrageenan, which means little rock in the Irish language, is a polysaccharide that is used as a thickening agent and an emulsifier. Another product you've benefited from, even if you haven't had much direct experience with it, is agar. Agar agar is the Malay word for the red alga that produces it. You've probably eaten your fair share of carrageenan. It's a very common ingredient in ice cream. Agar is another polysaccharide occasionally used in food production, but more commonly as a staple of microbiology labs. Agar is the substance that is melted down and poured into petri plates for growing bacteria and fungi. It can also be further refined into agarose, which is used for gel electrophoresis. This slide shows the sources of these products. Chondrus crispus is the principal source of carrageenan, and several species of Gracilaria and related genera produce agar. Moving right along into the green algae, phylum Chlorophyta. Like Rhodophyta, all members of Chlorophyta are photosynthetic, but they possess chlorophylls similar to plants as the primary photopigments. While many are sessile, or remain anchored in one place for most of their life cycle, some are modal. In individual cells, they often have a single large chloroplast. While Rhodophyta produce an array of interesting storage polysaccharides, Chlorophyta produce starch. There are unicellular, multicellular, and a great number of colonial species, such as Spirogyra, shown in the photo here. I'm going to walk you through three well-studied genera of green algae. First, Chlamydomonas. Chlamydomonas is an example of a unicellular green alga. You may think this image on the left reminds you of someone, but maybe you can't quite recall. Does this look familiar? Because Stephen Hillenbrand, creator of SpongeBob SquarePants, originally was a marine biologist, and he may have gotten some inspiration in his character design from this genus. Volvox is a colonial green alga. Inside the larger mother Volvox colony are the smaller daughter Volvox colonies. If the larger one ruptures, no big deal. The daughter colonies can persist independently. Ulva is also known as sea lettuce, and it is a multicellular green alga. Ulva was also our featured representative of isomorphic alternation of generations. The haploid and diploid phases of the life cycle appear identical, very different from what we will see in land plants. And speaking of land plants, let's end our discussion of Archaeplastida where we began with this slide. A couple of important points that bear repeating. This clade includes the kingdom plantae, the land plants, which will be the exclusive focus of Unit 2. Also, notice that while Rhodophyta and land plants are shown as monophyletic, the green algae are paraphyletic, since we cannot cleanly cut the tree in one spot and remove them without removing the land plants as well. Plasmodia are macroscopic, and you may encounter them out in the world in shady, moist places in the forest, for example. The plasmodium has many nuclei, but they aren't separated by cell membranes. Hence, it acts like one giant supercell. Some members have multiple spore stages, including a resistance structure called a sclerotium. 
one of the most common examples of a slime mold, which is also an important research model organism, is Physarum polycephalum, the yellow slime mold. Slime molds occur in a rainbow of colors, though they are often hidden in decaying leaves or under the bark of dead trees. They are important detritivores, though some are predators as well. One of the most familiar protists is the lowly amoeba. While there are amoeba-form protists in other clades of eukaryotes, the majority of them are in the Unicanta, and within this lineage of Unicanta. An amoeba is a eukaryotic blob that appears to have no planes of symmetry, and moves by pseudopodia, or false feet. Pseudopodia, you should remember, are extensions of the cytoplasm that are powered by microfilaments. In Rhizarians, we saw that pseudopodia may be very fine and needle-like, axopodia, or net-like, reticulopodia. But pseudopodia that are both wide and blobby are called lobopodia, like lobes. The clade Tubulinia includes the most famous amoebas, including the genus Amoeba and another genus Chaos. Like other diverse taxa, members of Tubulinia occur in a range of habitats. One place you won't see them, typically, is as pathogens. Which brings us to the third clade of amoebas, the parasitic forms. These were formerly called the gymnamoeba, or naked amoebas, to distinguish them and rhizarian amoebas with their calcareous and silicious tests. Now, Entamoeba constitutes one single genus distinct from the other naked amoebas. Entamoeba histolytica is the causal agent of amoebic dysentery. Here's another protist that I've known personally, again, from my experiences living in West Africa. Another disease that causes intestinal problems that left untreated can lead to dehydration and death. Entamoeba gingivalis is a species that is endemic to mouths, specifically the gingiva, or the gums, around the teeth. You may have heard of a pathogenic amoeba called the brain-eating amoeba that proliferates in warm water. That particular one is not one of the entamoebas, but rather a member of Excavata. This is another example of how difficult the resolution of the phylogeny of the protist has been and continues to be. Now we move into the Opisthocanta, which is our clade, along with fungi and, of course, a few protists. The name Opisthocanta means posterior facing flagellum, a synapomorphy found in animals and some fungi, but lost in many groups. On the right here is probably the most familiar flagellated cell in all of biology, sperm. The nucleariids have been difficult to place based on cellular anatomy alone. They are amoeboid, meaning they are like amoebas, but they have phylopodia. Phylopodia are needle-like pseudopodia that are flexible. Contrast them with axopodia, such as we saw in radiolarians, where the pseudopodia are long and skinny, but rigid. Also confusing is the loss of flagella. The nucleariids are unicellular, and they are typically detritivores or very tiny predators, feeding on bacteria, other protists, or algae. The coinoflagellates are a phylum of aquatic protists that are most interesting due to their relationship to the animal kingdom. They are unicellular, sometimes colonial, and their individual cells are very small. Recall that most eukaryotic cells are between 10 and 100 microns. In the image on the right, you can see a typical cell, which has the single flagellum we've been anticipating, with this collar of microvilli, which gives the organism a shape like a tiny thistle. The microvilli are projections of the cell that allow for filter feeding. The flagellum generates a tiny current that draws prey, such as bacteria, into the microvilli, and then these are brought into the cell in food vacuoles. In the not-too-distant future, we will see some animal cells that bear a striking resemblance to this thistle-shaped cell. And to give you a hint as to the identity of the animals with these cells, one genus of coanoflagellates is called Proterospongia. Here we see two final images from this fairly small phylum of protists. On the left, a cartoon of a solitary coanoflagellate, and on the right, a colonial coanoflagellate. To conclude this large chapter, another peek at the phylogram shown in our text. Think about how we might redraw it if we accept the early divergence of Unicanta. 
and our learning objectives once more. This concludes our first unit, and with that, our next task will be a test, or rather, an exam, not one of these three types of tests.